Hi, welcome. It's four minutes into the show. Welcome to Becoming Healers. Uh, my name is Drato. I'm the founder of Young MD, and I'm so excited for you to join us. This is Becoming Healers. It's a platform we've designed for you as healthcare workers. And if you're not a healthcare worker, we've designed it for you, the ordinary South African who wants to understand what it sounds like, what it feels like to be immersed in this space and to have chosen this profession and to have to serve people on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not alone today. As you can see, I'm joined by two amazing guests. Dineo Motofwane, she is a senior physiotherapist at a hospital in Johannesburg. She has a special interest in cardiorespiratory rehabilitation, especially in the ICU setting. And the second is Dr. Mishka Karsan. She is a comm server working in Pumalanga and she's the founder of Dr. Hepi, a healthcare empowerment program for people like you and me. So if you saw me rambling, that was my intro, you didn't miss much. <laughs> Ladies, can you unmute yourselves and Greet the people. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us, ladies. Um, you two are both busy in the front lines of COVID. So I just wanted to take a second as well to say thank you. Thank you so much for your hard work and your effort. I know a lot of he um, healthcare professionals don't feel like um, healers and he heroes in the space right now. So just thank you for all the hard work and effort you're putting into the space. I think just to set the tone, I'll have a lot more of the intro I was having by myself, which is just to explain to the people who hopped on what this platform is about. Becoming Healers is the platform we as the organization, YMD, have designed for healthcare workers to come together and really have great conversation and discussion in the hope that it'll help us move to a different place. And this place really is just acknowledging that while we are professionals with skills to help people at the bedside, there is a critical transition that is failing to happen. And that is recognizing that these professions need to be paired to some sort of a mission that enables us to respond to the dysfunctions facing South African healthcare. What we're suggesting is that while we are professionals, we need to become something more than that. And together with this premise comes a toolkit. A toolkit we are suggesting as an organization um, has some things that we believe can make it easier for healthcare professionals to move in the space in this way. And if you missed the first episode that's up on our YouTube page, this first tool we've uncovered is forgiveness. And that's why every single conversation we have in season one will be surrounded around forgiving the South African healthcare sector. What does that really look like? And today our guests are going to be helping us dissect this idea of being stuck in the mud, you know, stuck in the mud of, this, of the challenges facing South African healthcare as a healthcare professional. And I'm truly excited about what this conversation will bring out. So I hope you guys have your notebooks. I hope you have your your notes apps out, um, you're ready to take notes and hear what your peers have to say. And I'm particularly excited that we are actually discussing across disciplines with a physio and a doctor. And so to kick us off, ladies, I want to ask the first question, and I think maybe it's just to set the tone of this type of conversation. Um, uh, before I do that, I want to say house rules in order. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you are welcome to ask questions. If you have any questions, they'll be fed to me and we'll answer them as we go. So please ask questions, send hearts, you know, just engage us um, in the ways you know how. So my first my first question to you both, ladies, any of you can take this, is... What is a healer? How would you define it? Mishka? Oh, sorry, I think it just um, skipped a bit. But um, yeah, so firstly, um, I just want to say thank you, young MD, for what you do. You guys are incredible. And um, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure. If I can just quickly introduce myself um i am as you said a concert i'm currently working in rural um Pumala, and i am figuring out what it is to be a healer so what i have realized is that i'm passionate about humans healthcare and happiness but being a healer in the current um setting that we're in only kind of focuses on the healthcare part of it. Um, so I am trying to figure out how to be a healer. I don't actually have an answer for you. Um, 
at this stage. Awesome. Um, I appreciate the honesty of that, um, that answer. Um, and maybe, maybe just to nudge you, because I, I think it's important to sort of try and pull something from my guests as well. What do you think it looks like then every day to move through your space um, as someone who's making a change? Because I, I think you may not know how to pay the words to it, but you do do it. So um, if I can kind of put you um, in the picture of where my mind has been at, I finished med school, did internship, and somewhere along the line, I um, lost a lot of the passion that I had. Um, I lost a sense of self. I was just doing the work, living from call to call, um, waiting for leave and holidays, and a lot of what when people would ask me, and this is up to very, very recently, when people would ask me, so what um, are your plans for the future? My answer would be to retire. Um, and genuinely, I would just say, yep, to retire. Um, so I think what I'm trying to do now, and I'm trying to do this through Dr. Heppy, is to build myself up and to build other people up to get to a place again where we can care about human beings, care about being happy, um, having holistic care for our patients. Um, and I think this comes with healing ourselves first. Um, and that is kind of where I'm at at the moment um, because I've personally experienced um, being in low, low lows and not being able to kind of pour from a cup. I've, it, it, and it waxes and wanes. You just, it's very difficult to give good patient care and be a proper healer. Um, so that's what I think being a healer is, is you being healed as somebody yourself first and then being able to um, help others. Absolutely love it. I think I'm gonna comment on, um, your answers after Dee has answered. <laughs> so Dee, what is Anila to you? Hey, hi, so like I said, I, I'm Dinelle Mutohane. I am a physiotherapist at a tertiary hospital in Johannesburg um, with a special interest in uh, cardiovascular and respiratory rehabilitation within the intensive care unit. Um, so what does it mean to be a healer? And I think sometimes I don't, I don't feel like it. Um, so as a physiotherapist, one of our biggest things is that we assess and treat, we plan rehabilitative programs um, that need to be holistic, seeing a patient as a whole. And so as a healer, um, I do more than just um, help to rehabilitate and restore function. Um, but also I see myself as someone that helps people cross over a bridge and so your ailment your injury your place of being right now is hindering you from getting to the place where you need to be which is um health which is recovery and there's a there's basically water here yeah. and so what we are is the people that hold your hand and help you cross that bridge um essentially there's a few people on this bridge that's going to take you through that so it might be myself or the sister or the doctor but we need to get you to a point where you are not at where you began with, but to a place of healing, to a place of well-being, to full function, and you being well integrated into your community. Um, but like Nishka said, that means that in order to do that, in order to identify that in someone else, in order to do that holistically for someone else, that means within myself, I need to be able to have both resources in order to correctly and holistically care for the people and not just what they present with because people are not just conditions that they come in with. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for um, your insights and just how you answer that question. I ask this question a lot and I ask this question a lot in Young and D circles in particular because I think it's, it's, it's something that we need to start to realize we are. And I share many of the sentiments you share, but I just like to reflect on, on a few of the things that you said. You know, do you, you speak of the concept of sort of helping people um, walk across a bridge and get to a certain point. Um, and Mishka spoke so honestly about the fact that 
this is such a hard thing to relate to being a healer. And I think that is exactly the point of this platform. It's, it's us recognizing that we signed up to a profession that required so much more of us and and the healing that needs to take place is so far beyond the bedside and that's something that can be hard to reconcile and so in these conversations there is some sort of structure we'd like to suggest to try and help us unpack the complexity of the tools we were hoping to to provide in this space so for all intents and purposes forgiveness can be quite abstract like how do you forgive a healthcare sector what do you like well, how do you do that and what does it mean to be stuck in the mud in a profession and I asked that question to sort of set the tone for the first R we'd like to use, which is realizing. Really taking a second to take stock of where we are and where we are not. Um, and what I appreciated about both of your comments is that there was there's a real sense of just sometimes being unsure um, who you can be in the space and what's available for you to be in the space at the same time. I love I love what you what you said, Ms. Good, just about um, you you needing to figure out what that is every day. And I, I think that's absolutely true. And so my my first real question as it pertains to this idea of being stuck in the mud, and maybe before I ask the question to set the tone, you know, I think mud is a really, really messy thing. When you think of being in the mud, it's dirty, it's ugly, it's uncomfortable. You think of big, heavy cars trying to move through mud um, and they can't get past it. And, and what we're suggesting with this idea of being stuck in the mud is that there are professionals who are here in the truth of their professional roles, but very much stuck in some of the challenges facing South African healthcare. It makes it hard for them to progress. It makes it hard for them to choose a path uh, to continue on. And so I'd like to ask you both, um, I don't know who's gonna go first and who's not, um, what is your mud? What is the thing that you are stuck in as it pertains to South African healthcare? Um, so, Dene, is it okay if I start <laughs> to go ahead? Cool. So, I think, Lerato, you, all the words and how you described it is exactly how I feel. And um, it's the feeling of we working in um, situations and hospitals that are under resourced. Um, and as a result of this, that a lot of the people we are working with um, have kind of lost hope and lost motivation. And um, it is you coming as a new junior doctor, um, come with a concept from university that you're going to be saving lives, you're going to be kind of changing the system, you um, are going to just, it's going to be incredible. And this is how I felt um, when I started working in rural and when I started with my community service here. And a friend actually told me when I, I reached out to friends because I was like, I, I can't cope, it's too much. Like all of this under-resourced, um, difficult, just giving patients basic um, good care. And he said to me, you're not going to change the South African healthcare system. You have to kind of realize that. But having like, so realizing that firstly, um, and then saying, okay, well now I kind of can't fix everything in one go. I need to start small. Um, so yeah, like that realization of just, it's going to be hard. Um, it's not a perfect healthcare system but um, you can make it work in little ways. Um, that's, that's what being stuck in the mud is for me. Um, I just, before you answer D, I I love what you said, Mishka. I actually just like to spend some time comment on, commenting on it because um, I think there are some, some real true insight that, insights that many people resonate with. The weight of the challenges facing South African healthcare is huge. And when you step into it as a junior professional who really hoped that it would mean what it felt like it meant on the stage. You know, when you get into university, in medicine in particular, they tell you the cream of the crop. Um, and then you leave and you graduate and you feel like you've achieved the most important thing in the world. And then you, 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 you come face to face with the reality of South African healthcare and you lose a sense of identity. Um, and, and maybe just to 
So I think I'm gonna ask it. Sorry, Dia, I, the question is still coming to you, but I think um, maybe just to finish off how you answer the question, what are some of the things you lost um, because of what you found in the South African healthcare system that makes it difficult for you to recognize yourself here and now, or even associate yourself with this, associate associate yourself yourself with this idea of being? Um, so I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people, people have seen a stethoscope, a stethoscope is kind of jewelry because it takes away um, your youth. And I <laughs> fully resonate with that. Um, I think somewhere along the line, and it probably even started when I was a student, I lost that feeling of just um, being carefree and being happy all the time. Um, and a lot of the things that come with your youth, um, hope. I lost a lot of hope. Um, I hope and positivity. With I think if I had to sum up, hope and positivity were the things that I really lost along the way. And I'm slowly trying to regain that because for me, and I think a lot of colleagues and friends, those two things help you move forward. D. Hi. Um, so I think the the question was, what does it mean to be stuck in the mud, and what is my my mud for me? And I think when I saw this topic, and I was like, okay, so what is what is being stuck mean? What is a synonym for stuck? So attached, joined, fixed, uh, immobile, stagnant. And within my work environment, what does that look like? What are the things that keep me in the same position when my actual desire is to move forward, to impact, to not have to deal with the place of being that almost at times feels like quicksand, you know? Um, and, and sometimes it's people. It's, it's, it's people. It's the expectations. It's, um, it's cognitive biases as well. Um, it's a system that you come into and um, this is how we've always done things. So it's, it doesn't adapt, it is not fluid, it is not flexible. And I think just even as academics, you get told, okay, if you're going to do research and if research is going to actually be impactful, it needs to be taken within the last 10 years or whenever. And so you come into a system where people have always been in these positions and we're comfortable with, with dysfunction, honestly. And so a voice to say, oh, no, but I don't think perhaps this could work or perhaps that could work is left with, no, this is how we've always done it. And also I understand because if you've always dealt with the same challenges beat around people, resources, time, um, management, administration, uh, when those issues arise or they brought up, uh, you already know how to deal with them versus people being challenged uh, to have new strategies, um, expand their list, uh, like a bag of tools that they can use in order to deal with a different problem. And so it's one of those, oh, we know it's been broken for 10 years. Uh, there's, there's nothing we can do about it. And so what have I lost in the process? I think I was one of those people, students going into public especially because that is where I am passionate, that is where my heart is. Um, and say, you know what, I want patients to not even think that I'm in a public hospital because there isn't going to be a, I'm going to bridge the gap between private and public because if the perception is that private is better, if the perception is it's cleaner, it's more efficient, people are more knowledgeable and also, just being in a place where knowledge does not compete but serves, I think that is where I wanted to be. And so, where it came back to was okay, so this is how it's always been. And I think just coming from school, being in debate, being in leadership, and these positions, I think it gives you the confidence to kind of walk up to people and be like, hey, this is what I think works, this is what I think doesn't work. But I think at times when you face with so many, with such a place of like resistance and no, and um, have your place because this is how it's always been. And 
people before you haven't complained and if they have they've dealt with it then it's like the problem is you because you have the inability to adapt to this rigid environment versus the environment needs to be adaptable so that it can better serve the people that work in it and the people that are consumers of it um so it, it it's my voice it's the hope it's the expectation and it's me working together with others to kind of be the gap that i wanted to basically bridge when i came out of school coming into into the public sector or coming into the working environment i genuinely just had to exhale because wow firstly you guys have absolutely wrecked my speaking topics <laughs> I'm just like, wow, I'm absolutely mind blown. You guys have said so much. So let me summarize what I heard. Mishka, what I heard you say is that your mind is the sense of hopelessness and despair that didn't actually begin while you were facing the South African healthcare system. It began while you were surrounded by people who were supposed to be representing it. Um, and and D, I heard you saying that your mind is complacency and this inability to adapt and change. I absolutely adore what you said about research. You know, you spoke to how um, we 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 are trained at least for for like two seconds of our career to believe that we are scientists. And obviously, science is experimental and science is asking questions and science is challenging norms. And so science must change. Uh, but scientists find themselves immersed in environments where change cannot happen. Because along the way, things that are critical uh, for how we progress and how we move personally before it is professionally are lost along the way and i think that's something that's something that's that's quite traumatic for lack of a better term so i think in terms of the first r what we've realized is to your point mishka that that this sense of of being stuck in the mud does not originate before that and i think that in itself does not originate in the system it, it originates from what we're exposed to it originates from what we see and how we see uh people moving and i have a lot of questions in my mind um, about what that should look like then like how how do we do it differently how do we make sure that this this mud changes but i think we'll get there um in our conversation i actually want to take this this realization that we have of what the mud is and i'm not entirely sure we've, we've fleshed it out into its fullness yet uh, but i hope that as we continue to ask deeper questions we'll get there and um, now that you know what what the mud is for yourselves i want to challenge you with the question that can possibly help us transition into this idea of reconciling and and the value of reconciling is acknowledging paradigms it's saying that what i see is truth because it's, it's what I know and what you see is truth is because it's what you know. And I think the paradigms that need to meet here are every healthcare worker with the reality of the paradigm facing South African healthcare and the identity that needs to be taken on as a healer because of it. And so I would ask you, now that we know what your personal mind is and sort of where this, this journey with being stuck in the mud began, what do you believe is the mud between us as healthcare workers? Um, why is it that while we are aware that it is hope that we've lost and despair that we don't have and a lack of adaptability, why, why is this transcendence amongst us still? What's the mud between us? What's keeping us um, stuck, even if it means far apart from each other so that we can move towards a different direction? Okay. So, um, for me, I think that we are in a system, and Danielle, really, I think you spoke so well about it. Um, we're in a system that is busy. Um, the South African healthcare system is overloaded, especially public. Public sector is overloaded. Um, if you look at our clinic waiting times, they are unacceptable. Um, and when you're constantly faced with an overloaded system, you are tired, you don't have time for self-care, um, you don't have time for getting, you don't have time to be creative, 
you don't have time to develop relationships with your colleagues um, to work on yourself because you start your day early, you come home tired, you have a family at home. Um, it's almost like you're just in survival mode constantly. And when you're in um, a situation like that, you, your last priority is kind of thinking, how am I going to work this through with my colleagues at work? Because as you said, you know, like there is a system, it's been working all the time. Why am I wasting my energy now on trying to um, fix a system that is actually not working, it's dysfunctional? Um, but with that, as I said, the hope is not there. The um, kind of drive to change is not there. Um, it's not encouraged as well. Um, as you said, like you need to, as a junior doctor, you need to know your place. Um, you don't speak to consultants um, freely. You um, don't have enough experience. So what you say is not valuable. Um, and I think that's where it comes. We don't all respect each other's humans. We start with healthcare. Um, so yeah, I think we need to focus on people first and then us as healthcare workers. Hold up, D, hold up, D. I, I, I want to go. Please, can I go? Um, if you are not taking notes, I think that is a noteworthy moment because wow, we are not seeing each other as healthcare, like we're seeing the healthcare before we see the person. I know, I know that um, I asked the hard question, D, and I know that I asked um, sort of what's the mud between us, and I know that you're dying to give me an answer, but I must interject and challenge this idea that firstly, the system is working because it's existed, right? Can I, can I suggest that we've got a structure and it's potentially falling apart, one. Two, I have the privilege now in my life to, be, to have gotten an opportunity to work in corporate South Africa. And I can tell you with certainty um, that there is value in both. There is value in hierarchy and there's also value in ideas and in youth. And I think part of our mind is that we, we like, like you said, we're not pliable, we're not malleable, um, and we don't value ideas. It is so liberating to work in an environment where ideas matter, where the plight of, of, of our, our engagement is to innovate for the answer, right? Because we see the problem first. So if there's a problem, there is an answer, and we're gonna create the answer. And, and so, and start also, Dee, would you mind answering this as, as well? Why, why is it that while we know the truth of the fact that this system isn't really working well, we succumb to it? What, what about this mud is comfortable, may I suggest? What is it that makes it comfortable enough to continue even while we know that this is not okay? Um, okay, so the mud between us, uh, personally so hierarchy like Mishka said here's the thing if we are told or we are taught that everyone within the team has the same goal which is the management and the recovery of a patient that you you how everyone contributes towards this is not being seen as as equal or as valuable so we are almost we're living past each other because also I understand you've had a call, you've been on call for the last week, basically, you're tired. Um, or just you're having a bad day because as people, there's personal things that influence the energy that we're going to bring within our workspace. So there's, there's that. So it's like, okay, well, I don't feel that I need to engage an ally with, with regards to the decision that I'm making right now, because I save lives. So let me do what I need to do, save lives. You support me, which is not what the system is, which is not what anyone is taught. What we do is that as an independent practitioner, I come in and I say, hey, 
I have this and I feel that this tool can be used best this way in order to aid the patient in this manner or aid the system in this manner. So it, 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 could, be, it could be hierarchy that, like Mishka was saying, that you can't just go and, and, and speak to the consultant because that's, that's not something that happens or challenge what, how they think or why they think a certain way because, I mean, they have more experience than you. They've seen people with this condition come and go and they've managed and it and, and it has worked. Um, but people are individuals and and it, ICU teaches me that every single day that what worked with patient X will not work with patient Y. And that's why it's important to say, hey, I think that this is this or that is that. And I think a big part of it in, within my work environment, I I'm so grateful that I have the ability to go to consultants and say, hey, this is what I think. Or they call me and say, B, what do you think about us doing A, B, and C? And I'm like, okay, that's fine. This is how I can help aid in this environment or with this particular patient. Um, so people are tired. People are not seen. People are depleted. People are on a pedestal before they put the patient there and then we look towards working around them. And so uh, when we move sometimes our attention from what actually matters and what we came to do at work, then that creates mud between us. But also I don't think we fully understand the value in what someone else can bring. Or you just don't have knowledge what a dietitian does. You don't have knowledge what the speech therapist can do for you. You don't know what your physiotherapist can do. You, you don't know what the difference between a dietitian and a speech therapist is when you're trying to uh, find the correct feeds for the patient or assess whether or not they can swallow. So essentially, you're like, mm, no, it's fine. Just give them oral feeds and let's see what happens to them. And you're like, uh, no, there's people that actually went to school for this and they understand what is happening and they can actually aid you. Um, so it's a matter of, in this situation, I am all rounder, but also if you're going to be all rounder, then you're going to have to accept the responsibility of all rounding. And also then, if you're all rounding, what are the use of the decorative pieces that are within your department, if you're not actually going to use them? So, uh, so there's that. I think there's, there's, there's levels to why there's mud. So we're all, so why, why are people so comfortable being stuck in the mud? Because we're not alone. Because I'm not the first person in the mud. Because she had a call for two weeks and she lived and she's still in the mud. I look around me, we're all, stuck in the mud and so this says almost that it's okay it says almost that there's a place for this it says that if I am actually not in the mud there might be something that I'm not doing correctly I have not given enough of my own personal resources in order to have myself within a place of dysfunction or place of of being depleted which which in itself it poses a different problem altogether and a different question that we need to answer. And the thing about mud is it's, it has its place. I mean, if, if animals can use it to protect their skin, if mud can be used to make bricks, if, if mud has nutrients that other, I guess, systems depend on, in its context, it has its place. When used correctly, it has its place. But to fix or to, to attach or make me stagnant and immovable, then no, that's not what it's supposed to do. But I am not alone within this dysfunction and I'm not alone in the mud. And people that have come before me have come towards this mud and that this is what is to be expected. And if you're not at that place, then perhaps then you're not doing something correctly within the system. Mishka, do you have any thoughts or comments? I have many, but I'm, I'm, I just, I want you guys to go. Yeah, I also, <laughs> um, you know, the one thing that really, really resonated with me, what you said, um, Danae, was that 
if you're not in, uh, in the mud, then you're obviously like not doing the same thing, not doing the right thing. So um, personally, calls. We talk about calls. You have your post intake water. Nobody will ever admit that oh, it was a call that it was okay. Like, okay. Um, because it shows that, oh, but you know what? Like, weren't you working hard enough? Um, even if, if we look at the intake of patients, you had three patients, but dare you say like, oh, it was a good call. You're obviously not working hard enough. You obviously didn't put in your all. Um, and that culture is so toxic. And that is the culture that we are in um, from being a student to all the way to, I mean, I'm sure as a consultant. Um, and I think that is something that needs to be addressed. And young MD, you guys are really addressing that, but it, it, there needs to be a mind shift and it needs to be okay for you to admit that um, things are difficult, but also to kind of be okay with having a good quiet day at work. It's fine, it doesn't mean you're not working as hard. It just means that every day is different and that's fine. You cooked well today. Um, yeah. I mean, like, what on earth, ladies? <laughs> I don't even know where to begin because, wow, you guys said so much and, and, and I'd like to reflect on a few of the things. What I'm getting and what I'm understanding is the elements of our mind are so many things. They are toxicity, um, which is what Mishka just spoke on now, that like our, our mud doesn't even have room for you to be anything other than what the people who have been in the mud say it is, right? Um, and our mud is heavily burdened with assumption. I really want to sit there for a second. Um, and I think what I'm trying to say here is that idea that you're saying where we've got no permission because hierarchy exists and the consultant will not listen to you and the clinical man manager will not listen to you. What I have come to find as the founder of YoungMD, and I speak so humbly because we're not some major organization that's like lit in healthcare, all right? We are, we are quite small and we're doing, the, we're making the difference we can. But, but, but may I pose and suggest as the founder of this organization and that it is because we are unwilling to change our narrative that we're willing to sit in the assumptions of the narratives that have been set by people before us that we won't question it, right? So I'll give you an example. When this organization started, um, it wasn't an organization. I was just like, I want Helen Joseph to do better at orientating me. So I was like, I worked together with the um, intern rep and I was like, can we make an orientation manual? And um, people kept telling me that I cannot get access to the secretary of the CEO because I wasn't looking to just make a manual. I wanted to shoot a video in the hospital. Um, and I said, I said to, I remember telling the secretary because I've been asking for like days and weeks. And I said, no, the C I'm employed by the CEO. I'm his employee at the end of the day. I don't see how he's going to say no to me. Yes, I'm the intern in medicine and he doesn't know me by a so. But how about I walk away from you and go and ask him? And I, that's exactly what I did. I walked to the CEO's office and I told the secretary, I'm employed by the CEO, I'm an intern, and I would like to see him because I need him to get to the office of the MEC so I can shoot this video. And he was so receptive. He was so shocked that there was someone who was willing to help them. And I think um, what hierarchy gives us the descent or, or, or maintaining hierarchy rather, um, it creates an atmosphere where people below you must assume that that's the way it is and that's the framework and it has to stay that way and that you are happy with it. And I have found in, in building this organization that many of them are, are willing to acknowledge that it's been hard. Uh, and I think the turning point for us as a generation is actually to say, you know what, may I for a second acknowledge that perhaps where we are today was innovation when you were starting out. And I think it's, it's when we can't respect that what we're in today, which we consider to be mad, may have been worse back then, that we come into conversation with people who've come before us and cannot meet them um, um, with a willingness to truly help because we're just there to complain and we're frustrated and we're angry. So I think one of the greatest things standing in the way in our mind is that we've decided, we have assumed that there's no room to go and ask the consultant. We have assumed that my opinion as an intern does not matter. 
they've assumed that the change that I want to offer doesn't make a difference. And I think part of the major things that Becoming Healers wants to do is to break those lies because there's nothing that is a greater lie than that. You don't know if you don't try. And I think if we can, if we can reconcile ourselves in this reconcile station to that idea, um, you don't know if you don't try. I'll take you as an example, Mishka. You started Dr. Hippie a month ago. You were like, you know what? I can't change everything, but I can change the little, little things. And won't you share with us what the reception to that has been? Because I think we've told ourselves the story that this dysfunction is eternal. And it's only until we start untelling that story and start asking what the truth of the narrative is that we're going to find the truth. Um, so with Dr. Heppy, um, where it started actually is, for me, I felt like there wasn't enough support um, with the small things. So the human aspect, again, um, I, I don't think there is enough support now still. Um, and sometimes, or what I've realized is that you can't wait for the government. You can't wait for your clinical manager. You cannot wait for other people to make things better for you as much as you want them to. And the truth is that they might want you as well, but we just spoke about how hard this um, healthcare system is and how difficult it is to navigate through it. So if you can kind of create something for yourself to help you cope and what a pleasure it would be to share that with other people. So that's what I'm trying to do with Dr. Hippie. And it's really also just at its uh, baby phases where I'm just sharing what I wish I knew starting off because it's, takes a lot of time and energy to reinvent the wheel every single time when you have to still worry about a call and still worry about good patient management. If somebody would have just told me, hey, go look at this app or hey, um, giving a cup of coffee to your colleague post-call is really going to develop that relationship with your colleague, um, is going to show them that you care. And you know what? You're going to work with them better in the future. Um, so that's how I'm trying to reconcile and trying to make things work. Um, and I think it has been really well received. Um, I think that there is so much out there talking about the big things like how to put in a CVP or all of those things. You can find that everywhere. But not a lot of people talk about the silly little things about you know, comfortable shoes or that kind of thing. So that's where my focus is and where I want to share information. I um, just want to celebrate you. Yay. For just doing that and for starting because I think that really is um, the hardest part. And, and I think it's, it's, you said something so powerful. You said doing something for yourself and, and then hoping that it'll help. And we really believe at Yang MD that hope is an answer. And we really believe that each and every one of us, if we paired this profession to a mission, could be an answer to the ills facing South African healthcare. So thank you for being an answer in the way you know how. Um, and I hope that people who engage your platform truly find the help you hope they find. Um, and I agree completely, it is those little things. And, and that's essentially what we're trying to build here is what is the right toolkit apart from the stethoscope, apart from the autoscope that helps us move in the space in a way that, that, that is impactful, that is meaningful for us. Um, Dee, I want you to please um, speak on um, maybe some of your, 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 the assumptions that you think are sort of paralyzing for us that we need to reconcile. But then also you've spoken a lot on hierarchy. And I think um, I must apologize on behalf of the medical doctors in particular, because um, that is something we do um, by nature. There are learned behaviors that, that we do because we see it, you know. Um, we disregard the physio on the ward round because the consultant is rushing by. And I just actually wanted what he wants me to take on this patient is the intern. And then one day you hear the ridge fighting with the physio. And so you decide also um, that the physios um, are, aren't good enough or not taking good care of this patient. But I think you highlighted something so important about the fact that this person went and got a university education on how to do this. And our willingness 
to not be humble enough to say, hey, I actually don't know what's the best thing you could do in your skill set for this patient. I'd like you to please just unpack that for us a bit and, and perhaps share um, innovative ways where we can engage um, the allied team, especially as medical doctors who, who for, for all intents and purposes are seen as leaders of the healthcare team. I know the framework sets the patient, but let's get real, it really doesn't function that way in practice. Um, how do we allow you to lead as the physio and you to lead as a dietitian? And what can we do better um, to make sure that we're not making more mad by, by disregarding the people who are there to help us serve these patients? Uh, well, thank you for that question. Never been asked that in my years of being a physio. Like, how can we do it? How can we do it better? Um, so, and, and I think you use the word, how can we let the dietitian lead? How can we let the speech therapist lead? And I think, I don't speak for all allies, but as allies, we, we are aligned. And that's what we want, alignment. Um, I don't, I have no desire to, to lead this complete team but what I have a desire to do is contribute towards what you do for this patient in order to help get the best outcome possible from this um, so it could just be that you have absolutely no idea what we do within the space so I think people just cap it at oh no it's a that's a physio. They do they do sports. If a patient is injured, I mean they can I don't know they can give them crutches or, or or whatever that is. And I think especially when I say to people, so I have a special interest within the ICU. There there is a reason that I will get called by a consultant to say, hey, listen, I think that the slang is not re uh, re expanding what can you do? And I come in and I look at the ventilator and I look at the tidal volumes and I say, okay, cool. I'm going to request an x-ray in the next four hours and let me see what I can do and help assist you. What can you do? And I say, okay, cool. This is what I can do. I can help this technique. I can do this technique and then we'll do this. I mean, um, obviously within, within public, it's very difficult. And I, I know come in private and I mean, when the resources are there, when people work within a team, it, it, it's beautiful. And to say, okay, cool, our, our baby's back, or our, 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 the lung is back, it does what it needs to do, these things that are functioning. I, I think, and I get it, you guys are tired, you guys come in, there is, you switch, and there's the reputation as well, because also I find this, so at, at times you're just like, okay, uh, they said that I must refer this patient to you. And at times I'm like, okay, cool, you're the intern. Why do you particularly think that this person needs my help? But because you don't also know what I do or what's happening with this patient personally. You're like, oh no, this is not even my call. Like, can you perhaps just figure it out and then just write it in the notes and we'll get back to that. We'll see what happens with that. And you're like, no, 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 no. People go to school, people have honors degrees, people have Bachelor of Science, and that's not something, it's not something we just went and we bought. Essentially, we understand why we are there. Um, but also, if you're not going to use your resources, then and that in itself is misuse because then it's okay. You've decided that this patient needs an NG instead of actually doing a follow assessment and taking them outside of ICU before then assessing following. And then now they're on a full war diet and then they aspirate and then they back in the system, but we need beds. So what you don't understand is the decision that you make, even in the slightest where you think is insignificant in the long run helps does not help us because then the patient then needs a bed then we cannot admit a new patient who would perhaps perhaps i don't know have a better prognosis than the person that we we are basically continuing to harbor because you did not ask for help i think um when rotations start i mean 
with your manual, the manual that you wanted to do to orientate uh, interns that are coming into the hospital environment. So I remember speaking to my boss about this to say, hey, let's also have our own manual that says, hey, we are the allied. This is what we do. This is how we work. This is where we are founded. These are our speed dials. These are the services we offer. And if you are confused, call us and then we'll let you know. And we've tried to get into ward rounds even before they start to say, hey guys, this is what I do. This is what I get. I offer patients. This is what I can help you guys with. But because sometimes people are busy and really no one is listening because what you're anticipating is what the consultant is going to ask you on the round regarding the laparotomy and you need to be on your feet. And I'll say, okay, so you're calling me about this patient, but I had already explained in the round that this is what I do. So why are you referring this person to me? Oh, no, I, I, I was there, but I didn't take notes. And you're like, okay, cool. So essentially when people take time out of their day to be present within meetings, to be present and communicate things, those things need to be taken note of. Because if you don't do that with well people, how do you then do it with unwell people that at times are unable to speak for themselves, which then highlights a bigger problem? Um, I think even with people exchanging rounds, I think we got to a point where we needed to screen our own patients and say, hey, we feel that we're not getting enough referrals, uh, we're just going to go and see what happens with these patients and then provide our services to the people that actually need it because there is no way that in such a hospital there aren't people that actually need us. It doesn't make sense. And we found that there's so many people that actually do need us. So I think it looks like having a manual, having that distributed to interns when they start. I think that looks like um, allies being present in the ward round and being actually asked, what do you think is the best management you can offer within your scope of practice for this particular patient? Specifically, not so a question to the student, question to the intern, why wasn't this done? What do you want to do? Okay, mobilize, next. And then you move on and you're like, okay, but do you then understand that the patient had a stroke five years ago? And they still present as a hemi. Do you know the difference between a physio and an OT? Do you know what they can bring into the situation there? There isn't that. So also just coming in every morning. And if you want to do a round with the allies and say, hey, allies, can we meet at this time? And we go through all the patients. And if you think that this is a proper referral, then yes. And I think the more people get used to um, knowing what is appropriate and what is inappropriate, then we're not going to need to round very much longer because I already know what is expected and you, I trust that your referrals are legit because you understand what I do and you understand the value of what I can bring to what's managing the patient with me. Sure, D, like I think you said so much and I think a lot of it also leans on um, an inability to be self-aware. I think for me, what I'm, what I'm hearing in this reconcile moment is there's a, need, there's a need to reconcile ourselves to ourselves, to be aware of our deficits, to be aware of the team around us, to be aware of the asset that it brings, um, and to be aware of the asset that we can be in that space, you know. Um, like I said, I think from beyond an apology perspective, I really want to honor you as well for giving us strategy, because what you shared is just the how-to. Um, and I think a lot of people are afraid to acknowledge that they don't know how, because the, the space really doesn't give us permission to, be, to, to not know sometimes. Um, I, I studied at Stellenbosch University, and I, I really also I honor my seniors wherever they are. It is the one thing they taught us to know about ourselves is when you're in a situation, know when you don't know that here and now I am not it and I need to call for help. Um, and, and thank you for just charging us to be that, but also knowing that we can call on you um, as allies to assist us. I love what you said in the, in the early, you said allies are aligned, like you are there, you're ready to come from the back row and step in. But oftentimes we pull you out of line you know, we fix this one and we fix that one and we say, come here. Um, and, and maybe what's better is to call the line forward and say, hey, um, show us how to move forward in this space. Show us how to, how to lead, lead us about what you can offer in this space. And definitely want to encourage anybody who is an intern or a junior doctor 
um, to engage and to do it differently. You know, you don't have to do it the way you've seen it being done, especially if it's not working. Like we said earlier, if you know, if you know the model's not working, like why? I don't get comfortable in the mud, change the mud. And I think that helps us enter into our second last segment, which is re-educating ourselves. I think things that have come up in this conversation so far is that this mud must change. Whatever happens, this mud must change. And I love what you said, Deep, because you mentioned that mud has value. Like, it's not absolutely horrible. And when I was doing some research, um, just preparing the questions for this conversation, I learned about mud concrete and just how uh, mud concrete is, is a form of, of brick that is created from mud. It's designed because they actually want to um, avoid making unnatural products or unnatural brick. Um, and so the majority of mud concrete is mud and it's about 4% um, concrete and about 20% gravel. And so, and so when, I, when I saw it as well in the picture, Unlike concrete that's like quite gravelly, gravelly and rough, mud when it's hardened is strong, you can stand on it, you can walk on it, but it also has these huge cracks, which to me symbolize this idea that there's no perfect path. There's no perfect way to move through the space. And I think a lot of what makes people feel stuck in the mud as well is managing transitions. For example, yourself, Mishka, you now have to make the decision of what comes after Kamsa. All your life you've been told what to do how to do it it was actually fun you were in that mind you were rolling in it and now <laughs> you need to wake up one day and decide who you are whereas for dinero and the physios you've always had this consciousness that that day is coming you know i love public health care but i only have one year of come so that day is coming um what does it look like for you guys um um let me reconsider my question what do you think we need to use to bring sustainability to this mind so that people who are in moments of great transition um, can move more swiftly, can move not from a place of messy mud that's hard and stuck, but actually be on something that's concrete and just choose a path that, that honors who they are. Like, what, what must be added to this mud to make it something that's more solid? So, um, as I spoke, I was talking about it earlier where you cannot change a whole healthcare system. So obviously this mad that Daniel is speaking about, it works. A part of it has worked before and somewhere along the line, um, it's disintegrated. So I think it is important to realize and um, Lerato, you spoke about it as well, where the seniors had their own um, innovations and that's how they got to where they are today fine, I think we should accept that. But that doesn't mean that, um, and also with our ever-changing world, that modifications cannot be made. So um, it's important, I think, a mindset change is always the first place to start. And then also remember that wherever you're working, um, you can be the most resourced place and if the people working there are not great, it's, it's not going to work. So work is about the people you work with. And developing a team spirit is important. Um, and having team discussions, um, working together to focus on little changes. For me, little changes are so big because thinking about changing a healthcare system is extremely overwhelming. And I think that's where a lot of healthcare practitioners in South Africa are, because um, changing all x-rays to putting it on a computer is an extremely like, tough situation to think about and to change. But smaller changes can um, make people feel that oh, there is some hope. And I think when you um, start with little things, it builds onto something bigger and it snowballs onto something bigger. So, um, yeah, I think for me, that's where it would start. Love it. Thank you. Dee? Mm, sure. I think it's a, I think, I think it's a, it's a tough question because then it says that in order to make it what we need to be, we need to put in something that is absent, that does not exist right now. And so where does that start? 
that means that if we are changing whole systems, then we change it at a micro level, like Mishka said. At micro level, what does that look like? What do you add into the situation that makes it better? And it will probably always, always, always start with yourself. Um, I, it, would, it would mean that what looks like water to me and I think I've seen people build stuff and I think water is so important in in molding and moving and, and what does water look like? What does what is nourishment for you in that space that allows you to move a little bit more freely? What does that look like? And it looks different to everyone because that then requires that people are self aware, that they take stock with themselves and they say, hey, I need a meeting with myself and let's sit down and in, in what is it that makes me flow essentially? What is it that makes me more adaptable to changing? What makes me want to give more? What makes me want to mold and, 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 and do better, be better. So if, if whatever that is, means that it's something that is absent. And so you say, what is absent with regards to myself? that I can then put within the situation. Then I look at the environment that I'm in. What does this environment lack that it would probably work better with? And it, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't mean it, it's, not, it's not huge things. I mean, perhaps it's just acknowledgement. Perhaps it looks like having a ward round and say, sisters, well done on making sure that this patient in the last 12 hours did this. Or Mishka, thank you so much for staying an extra three hours to make sure that as a team we were able to pull through for this person. Or, or I think it's, it's things like that. It's what water looks like within your personal context, within the um, context of your, your environment, and how does that then change it as a whole. Because I think you find that when you move from rotation to rotation, so be it you go in surgery, or you go to OBS, or you go to pediatrics, there's always, there's a reputation that follows. And we're then being challenged to change the rep. And so if the reputation is that surgeons don't listen, they make decisions on their own, they do not consult anyone, then what does, then, what does that look like? It means that as the surgeon, you are picking up the phone, you are asking people, and you're saying, thank you for coming to see this patient. And you know what? The next time that you actually need help with a patient that's different, people are more likely to come to your aid quicker because you recognize people, you see people, but most importantly, you see yourself and you understand who you are within the context. Sure, ladies, I think you answered that question so well. Um, and I don't know if I would, I would add anything that's, that's sort of missing to the mat, but I think in this, this re-educating re ourselves section, I think that was a, an important question to ask, just wondering what's missing, you know, what is the missing link, what is the thing that I can bring value to, and in episode one we touched on that, you know, we spoke to how um, forgiving the South African healthcare sector really leans on a personal journey you understanding what the dream is that you lost, you recognizing what it is you're trying to recover, but you also knowing that there's so much value in who you are in the space and bringing that to the fore, because that's what's going to change the mud. I love what you said, Dee, when you spoke about like different forms, you know, somebody might look at the mud and think, ah, oh, I could make a pot of clay that could help carry things differently. Somebody might look at the mud and think, no, this could be like a little square block that can help someone else take the next step. Um, and I really think while those concepts are very abstract, our hope in Young MD is that people would know what it looks like to find the worth and the value of their person in the space. You know, um, Randy spoke in the first episode about how do you get the person who thinks they're funny to crack jokes in the environment to make them that easier? You know, um, how do you how do you get people to bring their personal value to the space? Um, and, and, and in closing, I guess, because we're getting to our last hour, we've, we've done all the hard work we have realized, we have reconciled, we have re-educated, and now we're going to get to this part of releasing ourselves to, to, to learn how to be unstuck in the mind. I guess my question with you, B, and I have questions, I need to consult it. Um, 
what are you guys personally? Because I think, I, and I'll start with you, Dee, because I think you were quite philosophical in your answer. I'm very sorry to say. <laughs> I would like to know <laughs> factually, like, what are you choosing to, to be unstuck from today? And what does it look like for you to walk that out? Um, and if unstuck means adding what's missing, what is that thing that you're going to add in the mind um, that, that you sort of drew from this conversation that can make it someone else's concrete? Ah, uh, so what is it that I am going to add? I, a voice, my voice. So I, I am, I'm a person that is very vocal. Um, but also I, I don't do well with complacency that is not critical and is not um, bold. So it, it's critical, but it's not constructive. And so I think moving away from a place of just being complacent, I think if you state the obvious, then you haven't contributed. What you are doing is doing what the people after you are going to do and say, hey, look, the sanction. The next person, hey, look, the sanction. Oh, look, there's the sanction. Then it becomes a monument. It's a museum of the sanction. And what we come to do is just view it. Um, versus people say, hey, look, the sanction. I'm taking a brick from that. And I'm going to then add myself to that. And I mean, like I said, when I came from Varsity, it looked like I want to bridge the gap between public and private um, healthcare provision within my scope of practice towards people. And I mean, it, it looks like calling Ms. Lillian and say, I'm a million. The ward doesn't look clean today. Are you off sick? Are you okay? Or can someone come and clean up? Um, it looks like a program because I mean, whenever you're entering the, the health sector, whenever you're applying, you need hours. That means that we get students. That means that people come and shadow you. And that means that shadowing looks different. That means that I pair up people with intent to say, okay, this is what we're going to show them, right? And this is how it's going to be presented. And this is how we are going to help aid what they view this to be and help them making a decision towards which path to go towards, you know? Um, it means that even within myself, so I'm, I'm funny, but I'm not like a comedian. But it means that um, adding humor to a very, a very stressful situation. I mean, it, it, it means being in rounds and saying, yo, guys, did you see during that recess, houses that whoever did this? And basically, that's what the person will be known for, but not as a form of bullying, we understand that, but as a form to say, we recognize you even in the midst of trying to achieve a goal together. And that's what it should be. Um, it, it, it means that I take leave. It means that I, I stay at home. It means that I journal. It means that I disconnect from the environment that I'm consistently in. And it means that I'm with my family and that I am reminded of of who I am, what my goals are, outside of what my title is. Because essentially, I cannot be a title to them, and I choose not to be a title to, to my patients, but as just servants, because essentially that's what I signed up for. But I can not then serve them from a cup that is empty. And I love what Dr. Nomshat just said in the, uh, in the first episode, and she was like, if you come empty, they will still take from you. We will dig into your empty. And then what that looks like is that not only am I stuck in the mud, but patients are stuck in the mud and this reputation follows us because then as a system, it is dysfunction. And once they enter the system, that means that they in themselves are dysfunctional and have failed with regards to choosing better for themselves with where they access healthcare which is something that then speaks personally to my goal to bridge the gap because then that means that we actually would widen the gap because we choose not to work on ourselves on a personal and individual level. Um, 
it means that I introduce myself to interns and I say, hey, I'm B. I am a senior socio. I am going to be working with you, not for you, but with you. And so what's going to happen is that if you have any questions, here's my speed dial. It's everywhere on the wall, but in case you need to know, here's my WhatsApp number. We can create a group if you want, and we can discuss what needs to happen for patients just to make sure that we all understand that the standard that we will always require of you is excellence. And you cannot be excused for being tired. Wow, Mishka. <laughs> um, anything to add on that? Like, um, I think my question is, what, what, what are you going to use to bring stability? And I think in some way you've answered that, especially as it pertains to um, your role with your organization. Um, but I think maybe what I, would, what I would ask you further is, what does it look like for you to bring people along, you know? Um, because I think you're quite clear about what this, this building um, or, or transforming the mud into concrete looks like. But what does it look like for you to, to help your peers come along? What I value so much about this evening's conversation is that if you take the time to engage with other healthcare professionals, and not only doctors, um, and that's why I really appreciate you guys for having Deneo on giving a different perspective um, in the healthcare space, is that you'll realize that we actually all do realize it's a dysfunctional system that needs to be changed. We all, I think, have it in us that we do want to change it, but um, we all need to work together to, to get there. And I think the more you engage with your colleagues about it, you will realize that people do have ideas and can really put in their own inputs and together you'll be able to make a bigger difference. Um, we need to, at the end of the day, rely on each other and respect each other as humans, not just as healthcare professionals. And if you take the healthcare professional out of it, you will see somebody who has had life experience different from yours, um, who has learned different coping mechanisms from yours. And it's so interesting to talk about that, learn about that, and then share it, take it to work and share it with the rest of you so that you can all together work um, towards the one common goal, which is giving excellent um, healthcare. Ladies, we are literally like out of time. Otherwise, this this, this um, <laughs> interview is going to be like an hour and a half long and that's not our intent at all. Um, and just to round up, I really want to thank you. I think, Dee, when you were speaking about what it looks like for you to be unstuck, you spoke about a hard place. Um, I, my heart is still stuck on that. Just this idea of it looks like taking leave. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge everybody who doesn't have that option. I think... Um, Part of why having these con like these conversations now is so critical is because I think the mud got messier. COVID has not made things easier for a lot of people. A lot of people don't want to feel like superheroes. A lot of people don't want to be anybody's saviors. They just want to be seen as people who are equally afraid and equally unsure about what what this means for them. They don't want to be a statistic, you know. They don't want to be counted amongst those who lost their lives. Um, and for many, the sacrifice has been taking leave. So I want to take a moment to honor those people who are in that situation. Um, I don't think that these conversations uh, will answer every questions, but at least will give us a platform to face the pain um, because you cannot forgive what you do not address. And, and if that's what you are needing to address right now is the fact that this is taken from you yet again, we are terribly sorry. And I hope that in your own way, unraveling your mind can look like expressing what else you need to make it a little bit better and that you would have hearing colleagues and hearing teams and hearing leaders to facilitate that. And Young MD as an organization is looking to know how we can help you there. So please shout um, if there's a way we can do that. But I really also just want to thank you as guests for coming on um, and, and also for the contribution you're making during COVID. Um, my favorite, favorite, favorite question, we cannot close any episode and I don't think we ever will without this question. In closing, please will you share with me what your hope for South African healthcare is? I believe in hope. 
Um, anybody who knows me knows that I, I, I say that my hope is not organic, it was just thought to me, and that's why Yang and D can exist, is because I know that things that are lost can be recovered. And while we live in the truth of a great dysfunction, I do believe that it is not eternal and it can, we can recover function. So ladies, would you, would you please bless my heart by telling me what your hope for South African health is? My hope, I have lots of hopes for the South African healthcare system, but I think that my hope is that people will see that there is hope and that you can realize that you can make a change um, no matter how small you are or small you are in the system um, and that that generates hope for your peers your colleagues and for people ahead of you and people below you and um, that you don't lose that hope that um, yeah that you can just work through it and still generate hope at the end of the day so sure. my hope I, I don't even know if I have the actual words to actually word it correctly, but my hope for the system is that it it has a place. Um, it has it has a place, and it's going to be at a place that is so much better than where it is right now. And so, in its actions, in it in its process because what it is is it's a journey that it is going through that there, there is a place for it and there's a place for it where it is so much greater than what it settles for right now because once we choose to not settle for it um it's limitless then what we we, we can go into um and just my hope is that the people that contribute towards it, whether they, they consume it or whether they actual laborers of the system, that within themselves, they do not lose hope for it, but that um, they understand that it is a process and not a place of just being stagnant. And in order to get to where we need to go as, as being in one path in alignment and having the same vision that we can then have or reconcile what we were taught to what we're actually in. Well, ladies, thank you so, so much. I just also want to take time to acknowledge that there was a question that was asked on um, the relevance of digital innovation. I did see it, um, but I do think it's better positioned in another conversation. We're having um, a stuck in the mud part two, um, as well as another another episode that I think would be better position to ask it in. So um, I'll, uh, I'll give you my thoughts. I think digital innovation is critically important. I think innovation is important. Um, and I think this is also part of, part of why we're doing Becoming Healers is because we need to innovate the ways we process our pain. We need to innovate the ways we engage as healthcare workers so that we can start to establish the fiber of the organization we want to see. So digital innovation is, is critical. Um, and I think it's the way healthcare is going and must go. Um, but I think my, my greatest ask would be that it doesn't end in the metros. Um, our best healthcare is in the big cities. Our best healthcare is where, where the consultants are. But that is not where the most healthcare is. The most healthcare is in the rural setting. The most healthcare is where, where the resources are diminished. So if we can innovate to make sure digital healthcare gets to where the people are, then I think we won. Um, and I think that should be the goal of digital innovation. So. Sorry, I didn't ask it to the speakers. I think um, it was better positioned for something else. And uh, again, I want to thank you all for joining us. Anybody who joined, who commented, who liked, thank you so much. I hope you'll share this conversation with your peers. Um, and I don't know about you, but I feel a little bit more unstuck. You know, I feel a little bit more aware about what it can take to unravel this mud that we are with that we are in. Um, I think there's been some great insights that's, that have come out, especially around the value of not assuming, managing hierarchy, valuing teams and valuing little things. And just to close, I want to share with you 
my hope for South African healthcare. I write a lot, so I wrote it down. And my hope for all of you who are listening is simply this. Um, I hope, our hope is that healers would heal. Our hope is that this generation finds within themselves the courage to show up for the healthcare system that faces them today, even if it's not the dream they signed up for. Our hope is that they realize that dysfunction does not have to be eternal and that they can interrupt that cycle. Our hope is to empower them with the tools and the strategy to be an answer. Thank you so much for joining us on the third episode of Becoming Healers. My name is Lerato Khatle. I'm the founder of UMD. Thank you to my amazing guests, Dr. Mishka Kassan and Dineo Motufane. Ladies and gentlemen, have a good evening. We'll see you in two weeks' time, the 22nd of May, to unpack something else. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>